So tonight we welcome back James Postel, who works largely in acrylics, oil and fresco painting. His current body of work explores semi-abstract scenes from, and for example, looking through rainy windshields as seen by a driver or a passenger's perspective. Mm -hmm. Tonight though, James will be giving a demonstration on fresco painting. It's an ancient tradition that came into prominence during the Italian Renaissance, and it is a method of painting water-based pigment on a freshly applied plaster. This is usually, and it, this is usually done on walls. It is James' passion to pass along what he has learned and what he continues to learn about this medium. So uh, welcome, James, and I'm going to let you go. Thanks, Audrey. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your time tonight and uh, listening to this. Um, I'm really looking forward to discussing fresco with you and talking about what I've learned. And um, there's always something new to learn with this medium. Um, so I'm just going to change the format on this and uh, so that you don't have to look at my mug. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn it around and just show you a couple of examples of frescoes that I've done. It's, uh, it's a very old medium, as Audrey said, that was done by the Romans, uh, Michelangelo, about uh, 1500 years after the Romans. Um, there are cave paintings that are based, uh, well, fresco is kind of based on cave painting in a way in, in which it works with limestone. And um, so I just wanted to get in close and show you a couple of examples of frescoes that I did about eight or so years ago. Uh, this is the copy of uh, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. It's one of the figures, one of the ignudo, they call them. Um, and this one here is a scene of the Coldstream Valley that I did a uh, similar time about eight years ago. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is going to be a demo uh, that's going to be just one um, panel. And I'm going to show you a video. Kit's going to show you a video that I sent her. Um, of how I prepared this panel. So what I did is I sealed it on the edges and on the front, and uh, I put a, um, a coating of uh, a slurry of gesso watered down and mixed with um, coarse sand, and I let that dry overnight. And then over top of that, I, uh, I plastered uh, two layers of plaster. So um, just to hop back to this one of the Coldstream Valley, this one was a little bit more involved in that there were uh, different sections that I worked on over different days. And I don't know if you'd really be able to see or not, but there are there are seams in it. Um, and there's one here. And frescoes um, can be divided into what are called giornatas. So that means uh, day's work. What can you do in a day's work? So in uh, according to ancient tradition with fresco, you plaster onto a wall the amount that you can figure you can paint in a day's work because oh. with, with, with plaster, the clock is ticking the moment you have it uh, laid down and it's already oxidizing with the air. So you have a certain amount of time in which to, to do your painting uh, before the plaster basically locks down and doesn't accept any more pigment. Um, there's a frescoist in LA that describes fresco as tattooing stone. And I always thought that's a very good analogy. It's like um, the pigments, they, they sink into the stone while it's wet. And then when they, um, it undergoes a chemical change with the, with, with the atmosphere. And then um, it's like uh, it locks down. And uh, that there's about an hour before it locks down where the conditions are perfect for plaster to accept pigment. And they call that the golden hour. So it literally slurps it off your brush. So I'm hoping that tonight um, that I can just kind of show you a basic uh, hair still life that I'm going to do. And it's going to be just like a monochrome because there's so little time. There's really just just over an hour to do a demo. So. I just want to kind of give you just a very basic, uh, the very basic technique involved in fresco painting um, in a traditional manner. There are many ways in which fresco is painted nowadays. There's actually a, a fresco artist down in Kentucky. He's a professor down at the university. His name is Mike Nichols. He's a, an incredible artist and really nice guy. And he does airbrushing on fresco. 
which is really cool. There are these figures that are very uh, indistinct and yet somehow realistic at the same time. So if you have a question later on or you want the name, I'll, I'll give it to you and give you the spelling later on. Um, but uh, before um, I turn you back over to Kit to get the video going, I just wanted to show you what I'm going to be using. Um, this is compressed charcoal that I just mashed a little bit into a, a pallet tray, my little pallet. And I've mixed that black with yellow ochre powder, which is pigment, uh, to make a, a kind of a greenish color. And uh, in uh, traditional fresco, that's called verdaccio. It's a, a mixture of yellow ochre and black that makes this greenish color. And the greenish color is painted onto the wet plaster. And that is going to be the underpainting that I'm going to do. So tonight you're gonna to be seeing basically um, an underpainting in progress. And uh, in fresco, that's where uh, Griselle came from. Like the whole technique of, of painting a monochrome in Griselle basically rooted, is rooted in the mo uh, method of fresco painting in which that was kind of a Griselle basically. Um, I can't think of anything else that I might be missing offhand. Does anybody have any questions before I turn you back over to Kit? Do you want to just briefly describe what we're going to be seeing in the video? Oh, yes, of course. So in the video, what I've done is I've prepared this panel. So uh, it's a, it's just a basic uh, cradle panel that you can get at Opus. And this is about uh, 8 by 10 is what that size is. And uh, in the video, I've prepared it with gesso that's been watered down a little bit. And then I've, uh, I've made a slurry of, of uh, gesso and water, sort of watery, and then mixed it with coarse sand. And I've, in the video, you'll see that I've prepared it by spreading it onto the, uh, onto the primed panel. And that is what the base is for um, the plaster that I've put on. So... I've put on two coats of plaster on top of that slurry mixture of gesso and uh, coarse sand. And uh, I find that that's a, quite a practical way of creating a fresco that you can literally paint and then hang it on the wall. So it's, um, for me, it's kind of a breakthrough. It's, it's so much more practical and much lighter than, than say using the back of a floor tile, which uh, when I started out doing fresco, that's primarily what I did them on was the backs of floor tiles. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, ho hopefully that answers your questions, and uh, I will turn you back over to Kit. All righty. So I'm going to run this uh, this video that James has prepared for us. Um, and if at any point you guys have questions for James, just um, speak up, and I can always pause the video, and James can reply or whatever. So um, please do. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to head over here, and I think I've got it teed up here. Now, um, one thing, of course, is when I play a video, the sound. So if it's not loud enough, um, let me know. Hey, everyone. Oh. I'd like to wish you all a happy new year as the final hour of 2023 wind down here in my studio. I'm, I was just like to uh, do a little video here of one of the prep steps involved in fresco painting. On uh, this time, on a wooden cradle panel available at Opus, uh, I'm going to use essential gesso, also from Opus, thinned up with a little bit of distilled water, mixed into a slightly watered down version, and I will paint the entire wooden surface completely to seal it in. It's the first step in uh, laying down a ground coat for the plaster. I'm going to mix some pebbles in with the gesso a little later once this is dry. And uh, that will be the ground coat for the plaster to grab onto, which is surprisingly strong.
And we're just going to seal this in. Slides. That aside, let's dry. It's drying. I'm going to show you exactly how to wash it down and to make the gesso. I'm going to turn it into kind of a slurry. Excuse me a moment. Let's see here that I've saved some larger pebbles from masonry of sand that I've washed and sieved. Let's fill this. Yep, before we dump that sand in, we're gonna load a piece of all here. Basically, just it has to be the, the surface, uh, the base on which the plaster is going to be grabbing. So we don't have to make a huge batch of slurry. Let's see, it's going to turn quite watery. Pretty good. Nice and scoopy. Let me make probably a little bit more, just to make sure there's enough to cover the entire surface. Really matter too much of that. Big pebbles out of it. Bit of fresco workshop. This step that you wouldn't have to do. Try to make the workshops uh, accessible to people so that it, they're not overwhelmed with every single step that's involved in fresco painting. I think it's probably good to know this these steps and know what what's possible. Know what I've learned, and then I can pass it along to you anyway, so that you have the information. And if you want to go forward and do this yourself at some point, then this is kind of the roadmap as to how to do it. So it's going to be pretty good. You know wet concrete, how it is, if you've ever seen wet concrete in a mixing truck, I don't know what I'm going after here. Let me, let me put a fair bit of body into this. I want I want uh, the plaster to have something to really grab onto. You wouldn't believe it, but once this goes on to the panel and it dries overnight, it is rock hard. It is not going anywhere. Huh. 
kind of opens up an advantage for fresco painting in that you can hang it on the wall easier on a cradle panel. It's a little bit lighter than, say, putting it onto a, a floor tile and a little more practical. So, move this stuff out of the way. Get the panel back here. It doesn't matter if it's wet. The point was this, the point was to seal. Make sure that it's nice and sealed. So, just like wet concrete, we pour it right onto the surface. It's been quite a few years since I've done this, so it's surprising how much it, easy it comes back. Yeah, this is the fun part. I'm like spreading sauce or. We're going to take it right up to the edge. We can completely plaster it right up to the edge. I'm looking forward to this demo. It's coming up in a week. So um, I'm hoping that you guys can see this before, before I actually do the demo because I, I'm going to, my plan is to actually do the demo on this panel. So this is going to be the base on which I lay the plaster. I will rely on the magicianship of Kit Bell. Kit, I thank you in advance for your technical help on, on doing all this stuff. You do not know what I'd do without your help. So thank you. Right up to the edge. I'm going to put a big pebble, so I'm just going to scrap those. They don't need to be there. A little bit too big. Yeah. Doesn't really matter. The edge. And remember that gesso and pebbles. And it's a bond that is very strong, as I've said before. Even it out a little bit. Well done. Thanks for watching. Look forward to seeing you guys in the new year. Happy New Year. Well, that was uh, that was excellent. Cool. Thank you for uh, for being able to do that. <laughs> it's uh it definitely helps and it's a multi-step process so to be able to have kind of condense it into you know a short time period like this is is uh, really helpful and just so, uh, so uh, just to clarify uh james you did you did that uh, like a week ago and then what you've done since is apply two layers of the plaster yeah two layers of plaster on top of that and I actually haven't sent you the video of me testing the slurry that I did in the, the video you just saw, but like there were pebbles that were just hanging off the side of this that were just held by the gesso. And I had to use all of my strengths to pry them off. Like they were just stuck on there. Like it's like crazy glue. It's, it's really an amazing base on which to put the plaster. So for me, it's a big breakthrough. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or comments? So where does the plaster come from, James? Well, the plaster is a mixture of lime and sand. And the lime is something that I slaked about 12 years ago. And um, if anybody is interested, I can send you a link that uh, is from an, uh, a video of me uh, during an artist residency I did in 2011, in which I slaked lime. And the lime that I used for the plaster tonight is that very lime. It's 12 year old lime. So, um, so the plaster is, is something that I make with a mixture of lime and masonry sand, uh, masonry sand, you know, you can get it any construction place or, you know, places that sell soil and rocks and gravel and stuff like that. You, you just want to get like masonry sand that goes in concrete. 
And um, I have another video that I've made of washing the sand and drying it on low in the oven for a couple of hours. Um, so as I said in the video, there are a lot of steps to Fresco that I'd like to be able to save people from having to do every single thing because it's probably not possible to to complete every single step in like say a, a workshop or something like that but um you know uh i did try and condense as much as i could into tonight's presentation to be able to kind of show you uh where where what steps uh lead up to it um i hope i've answered that question uh, could you use just regular lime that you bought at the garden center or it's not really a good idea no Hyd that's called hydrated lime and uh, it has a lot of magnesium in it, which would cause the plastic to crack. And uh -huh. uh, I found that out the hard way. Okay. Like back when I started doing fresco, there was no, there was no lime around, you know. So I had to go down to Langley to buy what's called quick lime. And quick lime is what you put into the water as a powder, and it creates this violent chemical reaction that bubbles and hisses and, and steams. It's extremely hot. It's called an exothermic reaction and, or an endothermic reaction. And that uh, it changes the quick lime into hydrated lime. Um, the difference between the hardware store variety that has magnesium and the quick lime that I bought down in Langley is that it was high calcium. So that there's no magnesium in it, no impurities. Uh, so as long as your sand is completely washed clean and completely dry, then when you mix it with the lime, you get very good plaster that will not crack. Okay. Do they use, they don't use that in house plastering, do they, or do they? Um, well, they do, or at least they used to like, um, like plastering is kind of considered to be, um, an art form that's not done as much these days, of course, because drywall came along and I think in the 1940s or something like that. Um, but um, I think the better the lime, the, the more durable the plaster would be. And of course, um, it's very important to use the proper kind of sand that you mix into your um, lime to make a, a good strong plaster. Like if you look at, at masonry sand um, under a microscope, you would see all the particles are very sharp and angular. And what that means is that when they are mixed with lime and they, they're crushed together, when you, when you mix plaster, all those sharp and angular particles will lock together. Uh, whereas in, uh, say, if you use like sand that's on a beach and you look at the particles under a microscope from a beach, uh, from sand from a beach there, all the particles are rounded. And, and that's, that's a bad thing because there's nothing for them to grab and your plaster will be weak. Oh, oh thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> so if, uh, uh, if you have, are there any other questions before I start? Can everybody see okay? Is that a good... Uh, mm -hmm. layout okay yeah. all right so i've just felt the plaster and it's nice and cool and damp which is a good sign and uh nothing's coming away on my hand white which is also a good sign so um i'm going to sit down uh this is my verdaccio mix as i showed you before that i'm going to have beside me and um i got this brush at opus and it's uh it's a size 14 watercolor fitch uh, Princeton is the variety or the brand name and I find it's very good because these fingers they'll give you um, really excellent brush marks and I'll I'll start right now and I'll show you exactly what I mean um, before I do start I did I did have this that I, I just spied right now and reminded me uh, this is called a pugging stick and what that's for it's to uh, has anybody heard of pugging clay you know where you get the air bubbles out of it? So um, that's basically what the pugging stick is for. So it's just to kind of condition your plaster, which is what I did before I spread this. Um, this is just leftover plaster, so I'm not gonna spread anymore, but I just wanted to make sure that I 
show that to you as well. Most of us are on mute, so that's why you're not hearing us respond. Okay, okay. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to interrupt at any time. So, we've got the drawing of pairs. This is kind of a time-honored image that I've been using for fresco demos for quite a long time. And I find, you know, for, for demos like this, it's, it's just a simple uh, study of form and shadow. And uh, and it's just uh, it's just about right for the amount of time that I have. So I'm going to get started. And uh, the very first thing that I'm going to do is I want to. Can anybody? I don't know if I'm just going to come over there just to make sure that I'm showing it to you. This is a tracing that I made of the drawing. And so what I'm going to do is this tracing has actually been used a few times before. It has the, the main lines of the composition are literally incised into the paper. I've used it so many times. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna lay this onto the, onto the wet plaster and with the handle of a small paintbrush with the rear of it, I'm gonna incise the lines into the plaster. Okay. All right. Let me know if anybody uh, needs to me to adjust this so you, you can see it better. Uh, good. so what I do, I'm just going to lay that on there. And then I incise main lines into the plaster. And this is fairly gentle. I'm not pressing that hard. I'm just trying to make a basically just a dent in the surface. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not transferring any color or, or, or anything. It's just sort of making a dent. Just a dent. Yeah. Just transferring the main lines of the composition. And then what's kind of neat about this method is that it's um, it's kind of a sculptural feeling. So it gives it a little bit more di dimensionality. And um, I find that the, the pigments, when I paint them, will they'll start to actually collect into the hollows of the incisions that I've made. And uh, it makes kind of a neat sculptural feeling. It, it, just, it just gives it a little bit more depth. Do you have to be careful how you position your hand? Like, is your hand actually going to make a a dent if you were to you know you it shouldn't I, no it, it shouldn't yeah just the actual tool just the actual tool and i'm it's, just kind of holding it i'm just holding the paper in place i'm not pressing really hard or anything like that it's just enough to kind of keep the paper still and really just a little bit of weight on the tool creates this incised line and, and the paper, actually, you see what I just did there? It makes it kind of rough if I go right into the plaster, which could be interesting if you want to make interesting textures. Uh, but for our purposes tonight, I just want to have a fairly smooth surface just to kind of show you like the, with the, that finishing trowel. Uh, this is a finishing trowel. Can everybody see that? Four and a half by 11 inch blade. It's about uh, $20 at Rona. So, you know, something like that is perfect. You know, you swipe it across. I, I use the end of it and go like that <coughs> a few times to make it nice and smooth. And then maybe do a swipe across just to kind of, just to kind of give it a nice flat um, effect. You could probably see right here that I kind of deliberately left some edging showing here, some roughness. And that's okay too, because 
in fresco like there's a lot of room for play and that you can actually do like a you could do an underlay surface that's quite smooth like this and then when it comes time to do a fresco you could plaster your second coat which is called by the way in intonaco so this coat here that i'm about to paint on is the intonaco coat in fresco painting um so you can you could uh, trowel your intonaco coat to show a ragged edge and you know not take it all the way out to the edge like i've kind of done here so there are some interesting visual effects you can get and uh sort of gives it a real um uh, feeling of antiquity when you look at something like that and it has kind of a neat matte finish you know like a cave painting almost so I have got my tracing done, so I'm going to move the tracing paper. It doesn't need to be there. Move everything off, and I guess it doesn't need to be there. Um, I did want to show you a pigment set that I have here. This, these are warm earth pigments, and I painted uh, the Michelangelo one that I showed you earlier on uh, with these particular pigments. So Ursulano Red, Verona Green Earth, and there's a dark one, uh, Cypress Raw Umber Medium, and Italian Raw Sienna. So they're your, you know, your basic uh, set of warm and cool earth colors, warm, co warm earth colors in this case, um, which are basically enough for you to be able to establish form and whatnot. And um, there are actually quite a wide range of fresco pigments available out there that a person could could use. Um, like, you know, you can really get quite a, a wide range of colors and, and uh, cool and warm primary colors. Um, if you looked at Diego Rivera's work, like he's, he used quite a, he used quite an extensive palette. So, you know, for such a, an old form of painting, there are really quite a lot of uh, um, avenues for colors that you can use. Now, I don't know if you can see it. I'm just going to add a bit of distilled water into my palette here just to have, just to thin out this paint a little bit. Create what's called a dispersion. So it's sort of like, if you think of it like watercolor painting, you're kind of making a, a dispersion here. I'm going to put it here so you can see. Um, Hopefully, is this still in the range of, of viewing? Can everybody see that okay? Yep. yep. No, it's good. Okay. All right. So, let's put the lid on that for a bit. Got some distilled water. Um, now, what I, what I do, like when the plaster is really tender like this, um, you can start with a fairly dry brush. So, what I've done is I've created my dispersion here. Um, you can kind of see on your back of your hand, you can test it. And that's actually pretty pretty dense so I can add quite a bit more water the thing about fresco painting is that you can you can really build up your forms gradually your your tones uh, so this is a good exercise in in uh, establishing your values so basically you can actually start with a fairly dry brush so I'll, I'll sometimes I'll squeeze the bristles together so that I have a fairly dry brush to begin with because the plaster itself is holds a lot of water, it's wet. So you don't really need to have too much water in your brush when you're starting. And I'm not worrying too much about making wrong or too much on there because as it sinks in, you'd be surprised, but what happens is that it sinks into the plaster and what you think is a really dark brush mark fades. And so you can, you know, you can keep building and building. And the trick is not to really overwork one particular area too much. So I'm just starting with the dark, darkest values in the drawing. Um, I'm just gonna put that there if that helps so you can kind of see my reference that I'm working from because I have my reference over here and you can't really see it. So if I put it there, then I figure you can probably maybe follow along better and see what I'm where I'm attempting to 
work from. I'm doing what's James, called you, yeah. Sorry, so, could you use just regular um, acrylic paint or watercolor paint? Uh, no, because um, lime will eventually um, eat away anything that's not um, compatible with lime. And typically what, what I'm using here are called earth pigments. So they're pigments that are right out of the ground, like yellow ochre is ground up rock, basically. And um, iron oxide is another one, green oxide um, to some degree. So they have to be earth pigments, really. Um, uh, ultramarine blue is usable in fresco. And that's great because that's, for me, is always a workhorse. Like that, that particular color is one I use a lot of. Um, but yeah, short answer, uh, no, like you could, you could try it, but I could probably tell you with some accuracy that it will not uh, stand up over time to the lime. It'll just fade away. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. The would, difference that, between... would that be pigment, pigment specific? Like if you had a yellow ochre that was a, a um, uh, from say a watercolor, would that would that work? Do you just have to stay away from the uh, synthetics and organics? Yeah, no synthetics or organics. Like uh, uh, anything plant-based would get eaten away uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, lime is a very, um, over time, it's a very caustic substance. Um, I'm not saying it's dangerous, but it's it's like a skin irritant. So that if you, you know, um, you know, if you work with lime over a long period of time, it's a good idea to wear gloves. And I, I should actually be wearing gloves, but and I usually do, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted my hand to be able to feel the line tonight to to be able to see um, how uh, how wet it was. But you know, you can if you use moisturizer when you're working with lime. After you know, you you might find your skin gets dry. So really, all lime is is a uh, it's a skin irritant. Um, and I would say it's no more dangerous than any of the paints, acrylics or oils that we use on the market. So you said you use ultramarine, but is that an earth pigment as well or? Where... It's it's considered an earth pigment. And I, I have used ultramarine in the past with frescoes um, and, and it's been it's been OK. It's um, it's probably not the best uh, earth pigment to use, but um i believe it is considered an earth pigment it's just that there are some earth pigments are better than others like like iron oxide red yellow ochre any of your your raw umbers and siennas uh those are excellent for frescoes so they you know they have a sort of an excellent good and poor rating and i would consider in my experience ultramarine to be a good rating like i've never i've never really had it fade um there's one okay. called Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, if you look at Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, there's blues in there. So what blue would they be? he be using? Well, he didn't actually, it's not actually a fresco that he did. He, oh. he was an experimenter and uh, he was a competitor of Michelangelo's at the time and uh, a rival. And, um, but Leonardo often experimented with different things. And um, what did he use? He used a, a mastic which is like a, it was like an oil-based primer that he put down. Um, he just, he, it was, the result was beautiful, of course. Like the Last Supper is the Last Supper. What, what can you say about that? But um, he used incompatible pigments and probably within about 70 years or even less, I think it was within his lifetime, uh, the, the Last Supper began to show signs of deterioration. Okay. Um, and because he used an experimental method and and I believe it was a uh, involved uh, using oil products and water together. Mm. Oh, thank you. That was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the person that taught me fresco, Father Dunstan Massey, he went to see the Last Supper a few years before he died. And uh, he always he described it to me as a beautiful ghost. Well, like they were able to piece it back together 
like a jigsaw puzzle and it must have taken them must have taken them decades to to fix it and uh i mean they did the best they could but you know they uh just because of the of the products that they use that leonardo used and the, the materials that he used it was just just incompatible from the get-go so the sistine chapel is all done this way yes yeah michelangelo oh. laid down plaster and then uh he did what were called giornatas so for his life-sized figures you know the superhuman nudes that he did on on them um it was um it was like he would he would lay down you know probably a three foot by six foot patch of plaster for each day's work father dunstan called him superhuman in in that he was able to you know create what he did I, I don't know lying on his back uh actually no that's a myth he he never oh, lied it? on his back really? he actually he actually stood on scaffolding with his with his neck crane back and his and his chest stuck stuck out he actually did a poem and uh a, a sketch of himself doing it and uh the poem was like him like crying the blues about it like he was just yeah. like i think it actually okay. adversely affected his health and his eyesight oh no kidding yeah because um like he tried he did devise methods of uh of having um, like protecting himself to some degree from the paint or from the um, pigments that rain down on him. But because his arm stuck straight up in the air over top of his head, like, you know how with candles, you, you do like a cone to protect yourself from the wax. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what he did, but it's still, it didn't stop everything. And, and in his poem, he described his face as a painted tapestry. And he said his, his back was, bowed like uh uh some mythical uh, person's bow and arrow it was really quite uh it was quite an interesting poem that he wrote about it but he was uh he was suffering no kidding wow. yeah I, I don't know if you know the story about uh michelangelo and pope julius nope pope julius at the time was a very incredibly strong personality they called him the warring pope like he went he was very wealthy his ch the church was very wealthy because he went to war and came back with you know the spoils from various campaigns um i mean later on as, as his, his it declined and he lost power but um at the beginning like he was really powerful and not to be meddled with like you know people in his court were executed for quite small things it was like henry the eighth in a way it was really very stressful um and michelangelo if, if it were anybody other than michelangelo he would have been hung for some of his comments and things that he that he said um and at one point um well pope julius was gonna grant him uh, a commission to uh to uh create a tomb of marble sculptures and and that's what Michelangelo all he wanted to be was a sculptor. He was he always said, "I'm not a painter. I always wanted just to be a sculptor, a sculptor." And um, and so he was promised this massive commission um, of Pope of a tomb for Pope Julius when he died. Well, the fortunes of war came along and things changed, and uh, Pope Julius wasn't able to give him the uh, tomb that he was promised and Michelangelo got really pissed off and he rode off and my, and Pope Julius is, you know, he was like, don't, don't walk away from me. <laughs> you know, he was like really, uh, really upset about that. Um, and he sent a messenger to where Michelangelo was hiding out. And the messenger was, you know, basically begging him to come back on the Pope's behalf. And, uh, and that's how, um, the Pope reeled him in was that he promised them the Sistine Chapel. Uh, so Michelangelo was like, all right. You know, I mean, uh, he probably saw the dollar signs uh, because at the time it, it would have made him a multimillionaire. Michelangelo was one of the first successful artists ever. And he was, 
he was sort of known for um, elevating the craft of of painting uh, above a simple craft and into actual actual art that's treasured. And um, and he you know kind of brought it to the forefront that artists should be respected and can be well rock stars. <laughs> that's kind of what he became basically. He was like a a very uh, he was very well known at the end of his life and he became quite rich. Well, that was a very interesting story. Thank you. You're mm -hmm. welcome. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it was interesting. Michelangelo was about twenty about twenty three years younger than Leonardo, just to kind of give you context. So Le uh, Michelangelo went to see Leonardo as a young artist and I don't think I think that they started off on the wrong foot I believe that's what happened was is Michelangelo kind of came like a shy artist looking for approval or something and Leonardo was kind of sniffing and like who are you you know kind of attitude and um, and that's where things kind of got off under the wrong foot you know Michelangelo is um in Italian, the word was terribilita. He had a he had a terribilita about his personality, so that if you got him angry, you know, watch out. They, you know, even even popes would see it and raise their eyebrows. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm very pleased with the plaster tonight. Like this is uh, really um, a nice ground to work on. It looks like that uh, brush of yours almost allows you to do something similar to cross hatching. That's exactly what it does. And um, and traditionally, and actually, if you look at Michelangelo's drawings and studies for his frescoes, um, you'll see that a lot of his drawings, in fact, are cross hatched, and um, and that kind of corresponds to the brushwork that that you can do. So. This is called a fitch, as I mentioned, and it has these fingers in it, which allow you to really uh, create the cross hatching effect. You can go different directions and create, you know, different um, different depths of shadow. So I, I've started with the really the darkest areas in the dry, and then what I want to do is I want to kind of light, or I'd like to just kind of. Make it a bit more watery in other areas because I just want to I want to lay down some lighter grays without getting too dark. But but it's just kind of a process of building up your tones. So this is a very watery application. Once the plaster is conditioned, like I've painted into it, and the areas on which I've in which I've painted already, you could say are conditioned. So you can actually go back and kind of break some of those lines that you you make right now in fresco. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to, you know, I can kind of make mid-tones. Um, there's not enough time to be able to demonstrate tonight how to make highlights. Like if you look at the drawing here, these are really high lit areas. And in the past, when I've done workshops and there's more time, I've shown how you can actually take a pure pigment like this and you can actually add lime to it because the lime itself is the whitener that you use in fresco painting. And, and what you do is you have a little practice piece of, of canvas or paper or even tile and you paint the, you paint a little, mix up a dispersion and you can, in a separate container, mix a little bit of lime, a little bit of lime, pure lime in with the pigment to make it a lighter value, uh, like a lighter shade of this, or uh, a tint, I should say. And then what you do is you take that tint, paint a little bit onto a tile, and if you have a hair dryer, you blow dry it, and it dries incredibly quickly. And then you can see if it's the right value, if it's too light, if it's too too much putty in, or too much lime in it, it'll go bleach white. Um, if it has too little lime in it, it, you won't really see much difference between this value and say the next value up that you want to create. So um, 
yeah, that, that's, that's another dimension to fresco painting that, you know, a, a person could, I could teach in a workshop that, you know, you can uh, take it a little bit of a step further, but for tonight's demo, it's basically going to be like watercolor painting. So I'm going to leave this area and these areas untouched. I'm not going to, I'm not going to paint any pigment in at all. That's similar to what you do in watercolor, just to, you know, leave the lightest areas light. James, you mentioned that it was dampish when you started to paint. Yeah. Um, so what happens? Does it dry and then you just can keep painting over the dry plaster or do you have to dampen it again? You have to dampen it every so often. Um, it's winter right now. So you don't, you know, it's, it's not like in the middle of summer when I, I actually painted a 55 square foot fresco uh, in 2013 out, outside in Vernon uh, during the late summer. And um, I had to keep <laughs> moistening the plaster with uh, water in a spray bottle. And that helped, you know, and also being in the shade a little bit also helped, you know, to even if you can drape a, a wet cloth, you can drape a wet cloth over top of it to, to help keep it um, dry as well. But, okay. But okay. I, so you're always painting on damp plaster. Then is yeah. This is this method is called buon fresco, uh, which means true fresco, um, and that is the method of painting on wet plaster. There, they they also um, artists in the distant past have also painted uh, what's called secco, which in Italian means to uh, dry. So they have painted on dry plaster. But that in itself is a it's another method. Um, I don't I haven't explored that method too much. I've often truthfully have been have found myself to be more fascinated with uh, with this process because it's just um, you have to be efficient somewhat um, like you have to have your your image ready to go. So in this case, you know, my drawing was pretty much figured out. I figured out the values and the composition. And, uh, you know, I have about probably a four hours painting time on this from now. You know, I could I could probably fiddle with this all night and I'd probably be OK if I kept uh, moistening it with water. Um, but, you know, like continually going over it with um, with with pigment and water like this is good. It's conditioning. It's conditioning the plaster as I go. It's it's like you don't ever overwork it too much. Like you probably, you may notice that I'm not going over any one particular area too many times. Mm. You see, I'm just trying to kind of work a few brush strokes in at a time. And it's like, it's kind of like maybe feeding a small child a cup of water, <laughs> you know, only sips at a time, thinking of it that way. Um, so James, there isn't a lot of room for error. Well, you know, if you make, if you decided the stem wasn't quite in the right place, would you yeah. be able to fix it or change it? Or I think to some degree you could. Um, it, traditionally in fresco, um, all the mistakes were kind of established and figured out and rectified uh, during the during the when they did the drawing. Yeah, you, you solve all your visual problems in the drawing first, right. and mm -hmm. you have. Exactly, you know, the composition, the stem place where you want it. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like just a structure in which to operate. Mm -hmm. Really is is all it is. Um, it's, it's really, there's really nothing like painting on living, breathing plaster. Like it's such <laughs> a, an incredible surface. It's like a living surface. It's really hard to describe mm. with, you know, short of doing it and uh, experiencing it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, I'm really pleased. Oh, sorry, you had a question? No, I was just going to say, so how did you do a 50, did you say 55 feet? 55 wow. square feet. How, yeah. how did you do that? You must have had to do it in sections then. Yeah, when I said jornadas, that's exactly what I did. And I did it in jornadas. And um, Honestly, I didn't really know what I was doing when I did that uh, <laughs> mural. I didn't do a Verdaccio underpainting. Um, 
not that it really matters anymore because it got it had to be destroyed sadly oh. Oh. yeah the art center around it was rotting like the you know all the stucco was like there were exposed areas to outside around it so it, the 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 mural was sitting on a on a rotting building so they oh. they had to tear it down sadly Wow. So did yeah. you do it in squares then? Is that what you did or? Uh, no, I, I did um, really giant cartoon drawings. So I, I did a, I came up with like a, a concept drawing for the whole thing first. And then I broke down the concept drawings into sections that I thought I could paint in a day's work. And then those, those sections that I could do in a day's work I created the cartoons on giant uh, newsprint. Like I had rolls of newsprint mm -hmm. and so if I needed to tape, splice them together, I would. And then um, what I did is I did two coats of plaster on, uh, it was a special drywall actually that, that they put up for me to do. Um, it was, uh, what was it called? Oh, it was a special drywall. I can't remember the name of it, but um on top of the drywall, I did uh, basically two coats of plaster, and that was that was good enough. Um, the one thing that was different to what I'm showing you tonight, the base coat, I used this kind of plaster mixed with masonry sand. But when I actually did the in, in Tanaco, I used uh, what's called dolomite sand. And anybody that's ever done ceramics might know what dolomite sand is. It's, it's like flour. It's so fine. And... Uh, so depending on what kind of um, sand you mix your lime with, you'll get a, an entirely different kind of plaster. So to get uh, this kind of plaster, you mix it with river sand and, or mas masonry sand, I should say. And you get kind of a slightly graininess, you know, with a nice little bit of tooth. It's sort of like sort of like working on cold pressed paper. You know, it's got a real nice, uh, just a really nice feeling. Your, your brush still glides over it but it has tooth or vibrato if you want to call it that um but when you're painting on um when you're painting on dolomite mixed plaster it's so different it's the consistency of your plaster is like cream cheese and uh what you have to do is you have to wet down your first coat of plaster with a little lump of the uh a, a little bit of lump of um cream cheese plaster and then you know when you when you um, when you take butter and you put it around a hot pan and it melts, mm -hmm. well, that's kind of what it does when you go over top of of uh, that base coat. It, it sort of be, it just kind of melts away, but it creates what's called a slip coat, and that slip coat is what um, enables you to uh, um, apply the cream cheese on top of, and it holds it. Um, it, otherwise it kind of peels right off when you plaster it on so that's the reason for a slip coat is to uh is to create a better bond between your coats of plaster um and hopefully i'm not i haven't digressed <laughs> from the question. that's but, what uh, i was that's what i was going to ask you james um because everything you're showing us right now is you know you're lying it's lying on a table yeah, but I know that you know normally when you plaster a wall, not for a fresco, but when you plaster a wall, there's usually like a metal mesh or something behind the plaster to hold it so it doesn't slump because it's vertical. That's right. Traditionally speaking, you do have uh, well, they they called it lath. And yes. In the old days, it was wooden slats, and even before the wooden slats, they used papyrus reeds. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and then in the modern times they used stainless steel, uh, stainless a stainless steel matrix, and mm -hmm. the, the the design of the matrix was like scoops. Each individual exactly. chain link uh, was was designed to be installed cupped upwards so that it would hold the plaster like a cup. Yes. Each individual little piece would. Um, and uh, but yeah, this is um, this you don't even. I didn't even need to use any kind of lath for the vertical one that I did because it, um, like I said, you know, with the proper um, conditioning with a little bit of a slip coat on the base coat before you apply the, 
the cream cheese, it, it held quite well. That's um, amazing. Yeah. You know, the, the trickiest part of that was uh, working from one jornada to the next jornada from day to day, because mm -hmm. what you do is when you're plastering your jornada out there and you, you've, um, you've transferred your drawing, say this is your jornada, and you don't need the whole bit here, like say your drawing only goes out to about here, like it's a good idea to allow yourself about, say, five inches of extra plaster around your jornada because those edges dry. And especially vertically, gravity is pulling the water down. So it's you have to you have to continually moisten the top because the top mm -hmm. is susceptible to drying. But mm -hmm. me tonight I can work in relative luxury because I'm on a flat tabletop and the, the water's not going anywhere. And uh and it's still nice and cold. And how would you join one piece to another with it? Uh, well, you can use a palette knife, Th not this exact palette knife, but the palette knife you hold on an angle and you, you bevel it when you carve it. Like say, say, like if you want to make um, two different sections, say you do a landscape, say you do a tree and some sky. Well, you don't want to make your jornada right in the middle of the sky. You want to make it, say, in the tree's shadow. Mm -hmm. Pigments are going to be extremely dark, and you're not uh -huh. going to see the jaw. Uh, or maybe the, the contour of the tree, where the tree meets the sky. And that's when I showed you the Coldstream Valley one that I did. That's what I was trying to do there, is to put my my joins in inconspicuous areas. I was trying to do that. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about if you use another color? Is it going to bleed? Because you're wet. Uh, no. Um, it'll do exactly what what this color is doing. It's just going to go right in, and it's basically like layering on top of layering. So you can almost think of it like acrylic painting, where you know where you where you paint fairly quickly, and you have like a shimmering effect where where one one layer goes over top of the other layer and you see traces of the layer below it. Okay. Are you going to show us another color? Well, I'm tempted to. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, why not? And then uh, I can yeah, actually I like show you a little that. bit about, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Oh, I just said, I'd like to see that. What happens when you add another color? Okay, I'll do that. Um, I guess I have to keep a pretty good check on the time. How much time do I have from now? It's eight. Eight. It's eight o'clock, so we we have okay, uh, yeah. a little less than half. A little less than half an hour. Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll work another fifteen minutes on this, building up the forms and the tones, and uh, maybe give me a fifteen minute warning. And then what I'll have to do is I'll need to uh, grind a little bit of pigment on here, which won't take that much time. It's basically sprinkling a little bit on here, a little bit of distilled water. And then just kind of muck it around, and then um, and then I'll I'll paint a little bit. So even maybe a ten minute warning from now. Mm -hmm. wondering and, if, I'm wondering if you know the um, clay board that's kind of popular nowadays for painting on, and it's also quite thirsty, and it really yeah. Sucks I up think the you paint. Could is it kind use... of similar? Yeah, I think it is. You could actually probably use clay board as well. Mm -hmm. um, because the artist, mm -hmm. um, I consider him a mentor, down in Los Angeles, Ilya, he said that uh, he's actually painted on clay. So mm -hmm. he's he's done frescoes like plastered right onto clay. So I think you could do something like that on clay board. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised, put it that way. James, could you tint the plaster before you put it down on the board? Yes, that's an excellent question. And yes, you certainly can. I uh, I was almost thinking of bringing up a sample to show you, but I did a, I did a portrait of the, you know, the statue of David. Mm -hmm. I did a head and shoulders portrait of him. I did a few over the years. And one of them, I tinted, uh, I tinted the plaster chromium green before I, I plastered it onto the surface. So yes, I'm glad you asked that. That's a, that's a great question. It, you know, um, when you uh, when you tint plaster, 
it um the thing about fresco painting is um you know how acrylics get darker when you paint them when they dry they they go yeah. darker mm -hmm. well fresco is kind of the opposite the colors actually get are lighter when they're dry Oh, that's similar to watercolor, eh? I think so. Um, one analogy that I always use about fresco is that it's like um, a river rock. You know mm. how a river rock is so rich and dark when it's wet? Mm -hmm. and when the water um, evaporates out of it, it, it uh, goes lighter. And that's kind of like what fresco does. But you can still get intensity of color, like, you know, looking at Looking at Diego Rivera's work, you can certainly get a real range of intensities in your colors. But I find that fresco is a really good um, exercise in working with values, which is what painting is all about. I, I believe that it's it's always values do all the work in painting. You know, you, to get the right value and the right value relationships, well, you know, um, fresco painting teaches all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it's, um, you don't, you don't have to be an expert draftsman or drawer to tape to do fresco, but um, it just will teach you, um, like, especially working in a monochrome color like this first, it just, um, it, it also might help an artist with efficiency and with, um, you know, yeah, being efficient with your planning before you go and paint something it's um it's, it's just a different methodology than uh say going in with multimedia or um mixing mixed media stuff like that where you know you have a bit more freedom in those mediums to to change things suddenly um and i mean free uh, fresco does have the same similar freedoms to change things and change your ideas but it's it's more in the drawing part of it that that it's the play, uh, that the play occurs. When it actually comes time to doing the fresco painting, it's um, you more or less have everything uh, figured out in advance. But um, like really, I- Sorry, is that really hard on your brushes? Um, it's, I would say no, because all you really need to do is just wash your brushes with hot water at the end and, and just make sure you wash all your tools. Um, because fresco painting and plaster is a cement, cementitious, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a substance. So it's like concrete and it's, uh, lime has a way of, uh, it builds up on stuff if you don't wash it off. So if you, you know, if you use your trowel and you, and you don't wipe it or wash it down, then it'll wreck it. So you have to you have to just kind of take care of your tools with this kind of a medium. Um, uh, because yeah, just, just uh, washing them really well is all you need to do. And then uh, like a trowel, you want to make sure and, and wipe it completely dry and have it sitting on an edge somewhere so that it's, you know, it doesn't scratch. Cause, uh, cause you want to have a nice clean blade that doesn't have, isn't damaged when you're going, you know, there's nothing worse than having a burr, show up in your plaster when you drag your finishing trowel if it has damage on it uh, oh. or rust spots you know if it rusts if you allow it to rust by not by washing it and not drying it um, the rust gets into the plaster and really makes life miserable so it's just a, a little bit of housekeeping really when it comes to fresco but you know nothing nothing outrageous But you see, you can start to really see that you can get some pretty subtle nuances of shadow kind of starting to come. You know, especially like fresco, you know, that it just has such a, a unique look too. Like when you look at a fresco painting from a distance, there's like that that plaster toothy surface really gives a, a vibrato and then combined with the brush, the, the uh, cross hatch brushing on it. It's to me, it's a really a unique kind of a thing that you, you don't see really anywhere else. 
if you get it too dark, can you back out of the out of the dark? You can by using, um, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, by using uh, by using lime itself as a whitener. You could mm -hmm. actually, if this is too dark, I could go back over top of it with a mixture of this color and lime, and and that would create a whitened spot. And that you really kind of have to play around with it because like if you just slap a white, some uh, lime putty right onto it, it just bleaches. Like it, it's, it goes incredibly white. Um, but there is a method that you can do. And I've, I've seen it and I've done it, I think a few times where you, you put the, the lime mixed color down and then you brush over top of it with glazing, you glaze it. So, you know, like in acrylic, it's like in acrylics where say you make something too dark and you want to lighten up an area, you can kind of do it the same way. You can, you can slap some titanium white down on an acrylic painting, let it dry and glaze over top of it with a color. And that's exactly what I'm trying to describe in fresco is you can kind of do the same thing. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But I guess what you really want to do is do what you're doing and build up the dark slowly so that you yeah. Yeah. And you know, it actually is kind of forgiving because what you think is really too dark, um, as it soaks into the plaster, it actually lightens up quite a bit and you can continually, and, and that, that's the advantage of working the whole painting too, is that you can kind of see where your values are going and you can kind of, it's, it's, I find it somewhat forgiving that way. You mentioned gla glazing. So how would you glaze? Is there, do you mix something else into it to do that? Yeah, like you could, you could mix something else into it. But what I'm talking about is you could take like a lime mixed version of this color, for example, and put it on there and it would lighten up. But then you could take this color in itself purely and put it over top of that white patch. And that, that softens the white patch and keeps it from uh, bleaching out as I described. Oh, okay. Yeah, just kind of like like in acrylics, like when you uh, when you want to lighten up and lighten up an area, and you wouldn't you wouldn't just leave it titanium white once it's been lightened up. You go over top of it with glazing. So all mm -hmm. I'm trying to say is that it's possible to do that with fresco as well. Okay, James, it's eight eleven. Just say so you know. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, just a few more, a little bit more here. Okay. I'll just try and build and make this a little bit darker, especially in this area. It's starting with something fairly basic, like a still life object, like a like fruit, I think is a good starting point. Like especially for you know a fresco workshop, it's uh, doing like a you're working with the the basics of light and shadow. You know, like a cast shadows, core shadows, and um, all, you know all the basic stuff that you learn with uh, rendering form and bounce lighting. Okay, so I'm going to uh, put some color on this now and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, give myself a slightly clean area here.
Well, we can go with some raw sienna. And a little bit of Verona green earth. We can try those two and see how they work. Do you need to be careful when working with dry pigment about breathing in? Yeah, it's it's a good idea to have a mask. And I actually should have a mask on right now, but <laughs> I'm not, you know, stomping around in it and I'm not pounding it around and creating giant clouds yeah. of dust. So as long as you use a bit of common sense, it's sort of like with working with any other paint media, just, you know, exercise a bit of caution. I, I you know, anytime I, there is um cloud dust raising involved i will certainly be i would certainly take precautions and wear wear a mask but yeah that's a good idea and you know uh rubber gloves are always good like especially you know if i'm if i'm um metering out um lime putty like i've i've sold lime putty to somebody back east and i you know scooping it out of the the big pails that i have you know you want to make sure and use um gloves it's a really a neat feeling though like lime has lime putty is really just an incredible texture but you can kind of you can wear gloves and still get a sense of the texture you know without harming your skin i don't have to grind the pigment or anything like that kind of on a abbreviated timeline here so I I'll be a little a little quicker than I normally would I actually take a little bit of this color drop it over here give it a bit more green So I've got kind of a yellow, kind of a cool green happening here. So let's just see what we get. Wow. I'm not sure how that I'm just gonna take a little bit of that more of that green. You should probably put the lid back on that little jar there. <laughs> good, good idea. Before right, I knock just it over. Just for it to go on the floor, you know. Yeah, really. <laughs> Murphy's Law, hey? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The most exciting part of fresco painting is the next morning when you take the fresco painting and run it under a tap. Hmm. And what that yeah. does is it's just a way of making sure that your um, your plaster has accepted the pigment and that it's um, it's bonded or it's it's in um, in the actual plaster if wow. it, so did you put a hose on that big 55 square foot one that you did uh, <laughs> no I didn't I didn't do the I didn't do the tap test at all 
but it did uh it did stay up for nine years oh, wow and it was um it was pretty good you know it, it was it was a, in a south facing parking lot in vernon um and i i have to say it actually it actually held up okay i was i was going to ask about that uh is there any kind of like you know an oil or acrylic you varnish for preserving a painting at the end do you do anything um after it's dried a kind of top coat i haven't actually um traditionally you don't but um i've i've never tried it but i've often toyed with the idea of going out and getting a bottle of that uh uh it's a sealer limestone sealer it's what they put on limestone countertops to protect them from like say acid or juice you know lemon juice and stuff like that and i think i think personally it would be okay to use some kind of a limestone sealer on there because it's um I think that's what it's, you know, it's, we're dealing with limestone here. This is what this is. Um, when this dries, it, it's, it's limestone again. And if you've ever heard the, the uh, expression cycle of frescoes, that's what, um, that's where the term comes from. A cycle of fresco means that, um, Quick lime comes from burned limestone. So limestone that's been burned in a kiln becomes quick lime. Quick, quick lime that's subjected to water then becomes hydrated lime. And then hydrated lime putty that's mixed with sand becomes uh, li uh, lime plaster. And then once the plaster is put on a wall and it oxidizes and dries, then it's once again, it's limestone. It's starting to look really rich. Looks good. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. some depth to it. But you can kind of see that underneath it, it's the skeleton of the form is that Verdaccio. You know, that's uh, that's what creates the form is the values, right? And uh, another analogy I've heard in fresco painting, it's like when you do <clears throat> like a drawing that's in, say, black and white, and then you put uh, cellophane over top of that drawing. It, that's kind of like the effect. That's kind of like what you're doing in fresco. It's like these are these these color layers I put on top of it are like uh, cellophane that mm. tint, they tint the, the values that I created. I'll try some of the yellower color and see how that looks. Just grab some pure, not so dirty colors here. See all these um these pigments that came in this box are already ground nice nice and fine. So I don't have to grind them per se. All I have to do is mix them with uh, some distilled water and a palette knife, and that's really sufficient for what I need.
if there's a time, maybe I'll take a bit of Ursulano red and put it on the background. If, is there time to do that? Probably well, not. We're at 825. <laughs> 825? Yeah. Okay, I'll be really fast. Okay. <laughs> It's interesting because when you were adding the first green, um, there wasn't that much of a perceptible dis difference. But now that you're adding the warmer uh, yellowy tones, all of a sudden the bluey green stand out again, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's all, it's that principle of putting one color next to another and, you know, you get a shimmering kind of an effect, right? <laughs> But it's, you know, it's fun to play and see, you know, what effects you get when you put one color down first. Because there are, you know, you would get, you'd get different effects, I'm sure, if I put the yellow down first and then I went over top mm -hmm. of that with green, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's uh, just kind of the, the general idea. Okay, if I have time, Ursulano Red. I haven't had a chance to use personal Ursulano red yet. <laughs> okay. Oop. You know, it's ideal if I if you have a one of those uh, plastic egg cartons, you know the plastic mm -hmm. ones. Those are perfect for this kind of stuff because you compartmentalize your colors. So that you don't get all this uh, bleed over happening, <laughs> which is happening right now. It's kind of like watercolor. It's not quite as indelible, I don't think. You know, like there is, you can move the color around to some degree while the plaster is wet. I find that it is, it is somewhat forgiving while it's, while it's wet. And I, I'd say that I'm in probably in the golden hour right now as far as the plaster is conditioned. Like mm. it's, um, it's really taking the, the color, the pigment really nicely right now. So James, how long can you work on this now before it gets too dry to work on? Well, I probably have another hour or two hours I could work on it. And I could keep wetting the plaster down with a water bottle if I wanted to. You know, that that to some extent, to some degree will will extend the life of it. Um, you see, what's happening right now uh, is it's oxidizing with the air. So the air oxidizes with the surface of the plaster and it creates crystals on the surface on a microscopic level. And um, another thing about putting layers on fresco, like one, um, it, it's stronger for the, 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 the fresco painting is more durable if you were to lay down a bunch of small thin layers of paint or um, pigment as opposed to one thick layer, because if you looked at it at a microscopic level, the um, each each layer of paint that goes down, um, the moment it goes down and the plaster is um, oxidizing with the atmosphere, and you're getting uh, you instantly are getting like a, a ring of or like a protective layer of crystallization over top of each pigment layer as it goes onto the surface, so. By doing uh, multiple thin layers, you you're um, you're protecting each layer individually, as opposed to slopping on one crusted layer of of pigment and um, only having one uh, one layer of uh, pigments or uh, crystallizing over top of it. Could I you put do... a 
damp cloth on it overnight and work on it again tomorrow or would that ruin it? I wouldn't ruin it. It it might slow it down because it's blocking it from from the air, right? So yes, I would say you probably could. Um, it would be because the same principle is that this plaster that I used tonight in that bowl, um, it's sealed. It's in a sealed container, so no air gets to it. So it's uh, it's a week old. So yes, um, if the plaster is uh, is protected from the air as much as possible and kept moist, not too moist that it washes away, but moist enough that, you know, you spritz it, say with a water uh, bottle, then yes, okay. I'd say you can, you can extend the life of it quite a bit. But now maybe, I have to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, maybe if you put saran over it and then the damp cloth on it, then you wouldn't be getting it i don't know i'm just wondering yeah that's possible um it's really just creating a um an air blockage you know you're just keeping the air from getting at it is right. what you're doing so yeah i would say th those would be good points um, i've never tried saran wrap myself but you know when it comes to a, a mix of plaster if i have some left over like tonight you know that that'll last another good week or two weeks in that sealed container um because right because the air can't get to it. So, um, you know, the fun part is experimenting. That's uh, totally, you know, when you, just by experimenting with this kind of stuff, I'm re actually really having to beat the color into the plaster now. Like it's, it's hard now, like it's conditioned. Whereas at the beginning of the session tonight, it was quite tender, but look at now, I can be quite rough on it. Can you mm -hmm. see that? Right. Um, just a little bit more green. We're just at eight thirty here, James. Yeah. Okay. Kid, I, I have I have a call from my daughter. She's in a bit of a panic. Can I go <laughs> and let you close the meeting down? Sure, no problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very right. much. Okay. Thank you. So, James, can can you hold that up a little bit to the camera? A bit closer now. Is that uh, okay? And a little bit lower. A little further away and a little bit lo There we go. Oh, that's lovely. Wow. That's amazing. That's just Look at all that yummy texture. It's pretty cool. It's like yeah. a, a, nothing like a living, breathing plaster surface. It's, a, it's oh, yeah. amazing. And do the colors, they mm. just stay fairly muted like that right you never they never get very vibrant do they no unless you use really vibrant colors i have like a really brilliant yellow pigment downstairs that i could be using and stuff oh. um it just it's just really planning your colors uh so you know you could do color studies of what where which areas do you want to be really vibrant and then you just you know, inventory which pigments you have and say, yep, I got a bright yellow for that section of my drawing that that'll work just fine. So, you know, you it doesn't always, it's not always just stuck with muted earth colors. Oh, um, okay. Just for the purpose of tonight, it was just to show you, you know, just the basic principle of, of how to paint a fresco. So if you hmm. wanted to get a really dark, dark, uh, what yep. would you, would what would you mix? Like a, a burnt umber and an ultramarine or something or... Yeah, yeah, you could do that actually. That would give you a very nice dark. Or, yeah. Even well, you know, and, and you know, iron oxide black is another thing that you can use in fresco painting as well. There's really um because that that's I think is an earth pigment as well. I'm yeah, fine. It's a mineral, fine black. yeah. It's a mineral. So um, you know, those would be good. But um, yeah, I, I do like the ultramarine mixed with an umber to make a nice rich dark without total black. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, black does have its place in frescoes as well. Like if you look at Diego Rivera's work, it can be very vibrant and colorful, but it's also he uses black in there, too. Yeah, there's yeah, there are really a lot of avenues to explore in mm -hmm. fresco. Uh, it's a very cool medium. Very nice. Very yeah. beautiful. Oh. Very nice.
<laughs> what a great uh, what a great art history lesson. That was oh, yeah. really yeah. really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yes, very very interesting. Hopefully that was yeah. Thank you. I hope that was of interest. Um, oh yeah, it totally I, I, was. I try I try to make fresco more accessible to people. You know, like especially to artists too. Like I'm trying to, you know, make it uh, more accessible here because there's just up to this point there's there there was no way to really do it. Where were you going to get lime putty? And I had to go out and slake it. So, <laughs> you know, now it's entirely possible to to go out and learn this medium. Cool. Amazing. Thank you, James. You're welcome. Wow. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks. That was James. really great. My pleasure. My pleasure. Amazing. Really Thank good. You. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Yeah. So I'll take my camera down, I suppose, here. Switch switch back to the front camera. Oh yeah. Oh oh yum. Ooh. Oh that's nice. Yes. Wow. That's a bit Beautiful. of light. Oh, wow. Wow. See, I would just yeah. you get the values in there, and you can build them up slowly. So, you know, in some ways, fresco is very forgiving. It looks burnished. Yeah. Mm. Hey. Yeah. Like almost almost like a metallic kind of look to it. Huh? Yeah, Amazing. I've, I've, done, I've done fresco workshops with the cream cheese fresco I've done where it looks burnished. Uh, you know, uh, the dolomite sand, it all depends on what uh, what sand you use. And with dolomite sand, you get a real burnished cream cheese kind of a texture. And, and that's what the Romans uh, did. Their, their frescoes were very highly polished. Oh, uh, uh, really? Wow. Because the, the surface is a lot more dense uh, than, than, say, uh, this surface. Because this surface with the particles being bigger, there's more room to create like a vibrato. But but with the dolomite, the particles are powdered or tiny. And they're just, they inundate the, the lime. And when you spread it on, it's extremely dense. So there's a there's a, a very different way that you paint on uh, on a, uh, on that kind of plaster than you would on this kind of plaster. I find this kind of plaster is more forgiving. Mm -hmm. Wow. Be nice yeah, to see beautiful. the other method too. Yeah. Well, mm. I, I do I've done workshops with that too. So it's definitely yeah. something that's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was I'm gonna run this under the tap either tomorrow or the next day. So I don't know if there's a way to for you guys to see the result or not. I can I don't know if I can give it uh, record it and post it to you, Kit. And would you be able to pass it on? Um, sure, you can. Uh, if you send me the um, the little recording, I can add it to the end of of uh, of this before I put it on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Yeah, interesting um, to see what the water does. Yeah, is that, is that a know. bit scary doing that? It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not really because if you if you you know that you pretty much know that it's going to be okay. Um, I, you know, I, I've done enough of, of the frescoes to know that it's going to be okay. Um, when it's not going to be okay is when you go past the golden hour and there is a, there would um, be a change. Right. You'll feel it. You'll feel the change when you paint, when it's past the golden hour and it's just sitting on the surface and you're just moving it around on the surface and it's not going um, in. That's, right. That'll run off, run off under the tap. But mm. I, I feel pretty safe and secure knowing that tomorrow I can blast this under the under the tap and it'll be OK. And it doesn't change the value or anything. No, it might it... It, it, it might lighten up a little bit. Mm. Um, I'll take a picture of it tonight and then I'll take a picture of it once it's oxidized and fully dry tomorrow and see how that is. But I might actually keep playing with this after I after we sign off because I. I'd like to keep going. I think. Yeah, it looks like you're still... on a you're on a roll there, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's feeling pretty good so far. So I think mm. I'm gonna just push it a little bit more and see what happens. Wow, excellent, very nice. You, you really have to plan to do it in one sitting. It's probably best to do it in one sitting, and and it's in it's entirely possible to do it that way. Um, you know, I've um, I've. I've done enough preparations and workshops to kind of have it down now where it, it can be done in one day and then people can take stuff away. There's, you know, that that's the ultimate objective is for somebody to go away with a piece like this and, and to 
you know, years later to say, Hey, it's still, it hasn't changed. It's, it's still the way it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of an advantage. Like it's, uh, you know, paintings on canvas and wood over, over the centuries will eventually, you know, the, the substrates would rot like canvas. It's, you know, how do you protect that over centuries? It's hard, but you know, with frescoes, it's plastered under the right conditions will last for centuries and even millennia. Hmm. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's what attracted me to fresco in the first place was the, the whole idea of creating something that lasts that long, but you know, the road to, to getting to it was was hard because I didn't well because I didn't have any access to lime putty that was that was probably the hardest part was actually making my own art supplies <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. and, and yeah. how how yeah. heavy is that now James is that uh, pretty is it pretty heavy it's not that heavy I would estimate it's about maybe five pounds right so a, a would, big, like a 24 by 36, it would get pretty heavy, <laughs> wouldn't it? It would get pretty heavy. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a, the professor I was telling you about, my friend down in Kentucky, he does a technique and I haven't done this yet. And someday I want to do it. It's called strapo. And strapo in Italian means to tear. And what that does is he uses a certain type of um, special kind of a glue, like he'll put He'll put gauze down on the surface first, and then he'll paint the glue. It used to be a certain type of animal hide glue, but nowadays it's a synthetic, non-cruelty to animals type of adhe <laughs> adhesive. The, you of paint course. it onto it, and what happens is, is when the glue dries, it curls. It starts to curl, and it, it, the gauze curls, and you pull the gauze, and it literally tears. Um, it literally tears the top into Naco's surface off like really thin huh. and then uh, this all gets left behind and then what happens is he takes this image that's stuck to uh, uh, pieces of gauze and and uh, synthetic glue and he'll he'll put it he'll glue the back of it and put it onto another surface that's say lighter than this like say if it was done on a tile or on a wall it would be heavy and immovable but when you use strapo, you've just got the thin intonaco layer of plaster and you can put it on anything. You could put it mm. on an ultra light panel. Um, right. anything. It's kind of, and, kind of like how they do canvas transferring now, e right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. With yes. a print. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's uh, just an old, older fashioned way of doing wow. it, but it's the same principle. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that is really hmm. neat. Yeah. It's exciting how many possibilities there are with this medium. Great. Well, I guess we'll have to call it a night there, but thank you so much, okay. James, for, for doing this demonstration for us. This has just been really, uh, yeah. really interesting. Like the art history lesson, the fresco, the mm. whole nine yards has just been great. So we'll That's need to, uh, to keep working on this now. <laughs> yes. And I'll, uh, like I say, kid, I'll send you some pics once it's done. Sure. And uh, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your time tonight and uh, listening to me babble on about it. <laughs> Our <laughs> pleasure. James. Our pleasure for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks okay. a lot, James. I'll okay. say good night. Thank you. Bye. Morning, everyone. Thanks to all of you who watched my presentation last night with the FCA. I am about to take this fresco painting from last night and run it under the tap to see if it worked. So we shall find out. After the meeting was over last night, I painted for about maybe 40 minutes beyond. So I think it was just getting to that point where the golden hour was closing and, and it was uh, going to lock down. So I'm very interested and excited and terrified all at the same time right now. <laughs> find out what happens here we go will this work drum roll please Well, I 
I'd say it appears to have survived the tap test. So there you have it. I'll send out images of it once it's dried, because the color will go back to what you saw on the camera just before I put it under the water. Just like uh, when a rock dries. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Talk to you all soon. Bye.